Welcome to the deep dive. We're here to really plunge into crucial information and get you right up to speed. Today, we're tackling something absolutely fundamental to, well, basically everything we do online, but it's often kind of invisible. We're talking about the constant threat of cyber attacks, data breaches. It feels like it's always escalating, right? Every bit of information, what we create, what we share, it's a huge asset. And honestly, it feels like it's always under siege. Now, you're probably thinking, okay, but we encrypt everything, don't we? That keeps it safe. And yeah, encryption is absolutely vital. But here's the catch, the big vulnerability just hiding there, that encryption is completely useless if the keys aren't totally safe, if they're at risk of being exposed game over. Exactly. It's like having the world best safe for your valuables. Yeah. But then you leave the key under the doormat. It just defeats the whole purpose. Right. Our sources really hammer this home. The cryptographic keys need careful storage, careful management. If they get exposed, it's as if the data wasn't even encrypted. It's the single point of failure. The strongest math in the world means nothing if someone could just grab the key. And that brings us to the solution we're diving into today. Hardware security modules, HSMs. Our mission is to really untack these things. What are these physical devices? Why are they so essential? How do they actually work? And what role do they play, you know, in the future of keeping things secure online? Think of them as these sort of unsung heroes guarding the very heart of digital trust, those critical keys. Okay, let's dig into this a bit more. We live in this world where it seems like everyone's in this, I know, wild race to get information owned by others. We encrypt our emails, banking, cloud files, even smart speakers. So if we're encrypting so much, why isn't that enough? Well, as you said, it all comes back to the keys, the cryptographic keys. Mm. Encryption turns your data into secret code, sure, but its strength completely disappears if the key to unlock that code gets compromised. It really is just like that vault in the key under the doormat. The data security is totally tied to the key security. And this isn't just some abstract problem for big companies. Uh, no, it impacts every single one of us using digital services, online banking, sending messages, even just browsing websites. Your personal data, your privacy, your money, it all relies on those keys staying protected. If the keys securing your bank transfer are vulnerable, well, then so is your money. It's that direct. Okay, so if the key is the weak link, how do we build like an impenetrable fortress around it? And this is where these hardware security modules come in. What exactly is an HSM? It sounds pretty high tech. It is high tech, yeah. but maybe more practical than sci-fi. Mm -hmm. um, fundamentally, an HSM is a physical computing device. It's designed specifically for cybersecurity tasks, things like authentication, authorization, keeping data confidential, ensuring data integrity. The really key difference here is that it's physical hardware. It's not just software running on a regular server. It provides the secure, isolated place, a hardened environment, specifically for doing cryptographic operations. It's a dedicated box, not just another program. Right, a dedicated box. And its main jobs are, well, secure management of those crypto keys, yeah. right? It kind of encapsulates them, keeps them isolated with special mechanisms to stop tampering. And you mentioned it also speeds things up. Hardware acceleration for crypto stuff. Exactly. That acceleration is a big plus too. And their versatility is huge. You find HSMs pretty much everywhere. Secure digital interactions are happening. Oh. Cloud infrastructure, web servers powering the internet, definitely in card payment systems, you know, banking, mm -hmm. governments use them, public sector organizations. And even in newer areas like blockchain platforms, car manufacturers, IoT device developers, they're foundational. Okay. When we think about keeping data safe, usually we picture it just sitting there, like on a server desk or in a database, data at rest. But data is always moving around networks, and it's being actively used by applications. How do HSMs help protect data in all those stages? That's a really important distinction. Data isn't static. And HSMs do play a role across the board. So for data in transit data zipping across networks, HSMs are key for encryption and authentication, often using protocols like TLS. TLS, that's the little padlock in my browser, right? Keeping the connection secure. Precisely. HSMs manage the keys that make that secure connection possible. Then for data at rest, data just sitting on a hard drive or storage media, HSMs protect the keys used to encrypt that stored data. They manage the keys needed to lock it down and unlock it when needed. And then there's data in use. This is data that's actively being processed by software. Here, security mostly comes from something called trusted execution environments, or T's. T's create this isolated little bubble within the processor where applications can run securely, totally separate from everything else in the system. So even while the data is being worked on, it's protected. HSMs often manage the keys used by these TEs. Ah, okay. So it's not just about 
lock boxes and secure tunnels. It's also about protecting data while it's actually being, you know, crunched by the computer. That's really comprehensive. We've talked about protecting keys once they exist, but what about making them in the first place? We always hear keys need to be random, but how random can a computer, which follows instructions, actually be? And why does that randomness matter so much? Yeah, that's a fundamental challenge in cryptography. Good crypto relies heavily on randomness, especially for generating strong keys. The problem is, like you said, computers are deterministic, they follow scripts. Generating true, unpredictable randomness is actually um, quite difficult for standard computers. They might use algorithms that look random, but they aren't truly unpredictable if you know the starting point. HSMs tackle this head on. They have a dedicated hardware based random number generator inside. Instead of just an algorithm, it actually drives randomness from physical processes, uh, things like tiny fluctuations in electrical voltage, thermal noise, sometimes even quantum effects. From physics. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, it taps into the inherent unpredictability of the physical world. This ensures the random numbers used to create keys are genuinely high quality and unpredictable. And this brings up the difference between true random number generators, TRNGs, and pseudo-random number generators, PRNGs. TRNGs, like those in HSMs, extract randomness from actual physical stuff, the electrical noise, maybe radioactive decay, temperature changes. They produce real random data. PRNGs are algorithms. They produce sequences that look random, but they're deterministic. If you know the starting seed, you can predict the sequence. HSMs use TRNGs as the source. Sometimes they might process those true random bits through a PRNG for statistical reasons or efficiency, but the unpredictable foundation comes from the hardware. It's pretty amazing when you think about it. They're literally pulling randomness from the universe to forge these keys. That physical entropy is what makes them strong. Wow. Okay. Tapping into the universe for keys. That's quite something. And sticking with the high security theme, you mentioned tamper resistance earlier. This sounds almost like a spy gadget, a box that knows if someone's messing with it. What does tamper resistance actually involve? It means exactly what it sounds like. The device is built to resist unauthorized attempts to get at the keys inside, physically or logically. It's absolutely critical. Designing for tamper resistance is one of the top priorities for any secure system like this. You've got two main kinds. First, physical tamper resistance. HSMs have sensors and mechanisms built in to detect if someone tries to open the casing, drill into it, maybe subject it to extreme temperatures, things like that. Okay. And what happens if it detects that? If it detects a physical attack, a special part called the tamper evidence module kicks in. Its job is to immediately zeroize the keys. That means it securely erases all the cryptographic keys and sensitive data stored inside. Poof. Gone. It destroys the keys. Destroys them. The idea is it's better to destroy the keys than let them fall into the wrong hands. It prevents disclosure, even if the attacker gets physical access. It's a drastic but very effective final defense. Mm. Then there's also logical tamper resistance. This means the internal circuits and software are designed to resist attacks coming from the network or through software interfaces. It's hardened against non-physical hacking attempts, too. So it's a fortress from both the outside and the inside, electronically speaking. That zero-eyes function is pretty dramatic, though, destroying the very thing it's meant to protect. Is that common? It's definitely the last resort, designed for those extreme physical breach scenarios. The number one goal is preventing key disclosure at all costs. But HSMs offer more than just that ultimate fail-safe and the secure key management and acceleration we've covered. They generate those truly unpredictable keys, as we discussed. They keep them secure right from creation until they're no longer needed, and crucially, they keep them separate from the application servers. They even encrypt the encryption keys themselves when stored internally, adding another security layer. No plain text keys just sitting there. And another big advantage is server performance. We touched on acceleration. Right, offloading the crypto work. Exactly. Because HSMs are specialized, stripped-down devices, they take that heavy cryptographic processing load off the main web servers or application servers. This frees up the servers to do their main job better, faster. So HSMs act as sort of web traffic accelerators in that sense, improving overall system performance. So it's not just about locking things down. It actually makes things run smoother, too? It can, yeah. Yeah. And finally, there's compliance. This is huge for many organizations. HSMs are typically certified against rigorous industry security standards, like FIPS 142 or common criteria. They provide detailed, secure logs of all key management and cryptographic operations. This is essential for audits and proving compliance with regulations like PCI DSS for payments or GDPR for data privacy. Okay, so for anyone running a busy online service or handling sensitive stuff like health records or financial data, 
HSM seemed like a triple win, better security, better performance, and help with ticking those compliance boxes. It really builds that crucial trust. Now, some people listening might have heard of TPMs, trusted platform modules. Aren't those sometimes built into laptops? How are they different from these HSMs we're discussing? They both sound like secure hardware. That's a really common point of confusion because, yes, they're both secure, tamper-resistant hardware but they serve very different purposes and scales. A TPM, a trusted platform module, is usually a chip right on the motherboard of an individual device like your laptop or a server. It's tied specifically to that single parent device. Its main jobs are things like storing keys unique to that machine, mm -hmm. perhaps for disk encryption or secure boot, and verifying the integrity of that specific device. Think of it like a personal bodyguard chip for one computer. Okay, so one TPM per machine, basically. Pretty much. Now, an HSM is different. It's typically an external device or maybe a card you plug into a server, but it's designed to serve many devices and applications across a whole network or organization. It's not tied to one machine. It acts as a central shared high security resource for cryptographic services for potentially hundreds or thousands of applications and servers. It's built for security at scale. Ah, I see. So TPM is personal security for one device. HSM is like a central security vault for the whole organization's crypto needs. That's a good way to put it. Understanding that scale difference is key to knowing which tool fits which security requirement. And just to give you a quick peek inside, architecturally, an HSM usually has about four main parts working together. You've got the control and encryption module, that's co the core processor doing the actual crypto work, encrypting, decrypting, managing keys, often using strong algorithms like AES. Then the power supply. Importantly, this often includes a battery backup, usually lithium. Why? To keep that tamper detection circuitry alive, even if the main power is cut. Ah, so you can't just unplug it to disable the tamper protection. Clever. Exactly. Third is the random number generator module we talked about, that hardware-based source of true randomness from physical noise, like a noisy transistor or diode. And fourth is the tamper evidence module itself. This is the system of sensors and logic designed to detect physical attacks and trigger that zero-eyes response, erasing the keys. It really is like a tiny self-contained fortress, isn't it? Every piece designed purely for security and resilience, all focused on protecting those keys. Okay, let's look forward a bit. We have huge tech trends constantly reshaping things. How do things like Moore's Law, and especially this looming giant of quantum computing, how do they affect cybersecurity and these HSMs? Well, Moore's Law, the idea that computing power roughly doubles every couple of years, has a mixed effect. On one hand, more powerful computers allow for stronger encryption algorithms and faster security processing, which is good. HSMs benefit from faster chips, too. But it also means attackers get more powerful tools. Over time, brute forcing weaker keys, especially symmetric keys like older versions of DES or maybe even AES with shorter key lengths, becomes more feasible. Interestingly, algorithms like RSA, based on factoring large numbers, aren't quite as susceptible to just raw speed increases from Moore's Law alone. The underlying math problem remains hard. Okay, so Moore's Law is a kind of arms race. What about quantum computing? That sounds like a whole different ballgame. It absolutely is. Quantum computing, using qui bits instead of traditional bits, operates on fundamentally different principles. It allows for certain types of calculations to be done exponentially faster. And this has a massive potential impact on cryptography. It's built a huge threat. Uh oh. Because quantum algorithms, like Shor's algorithm, are known to be capable of breaking many of the public key crypto systems we rely on today, including RSA and elliptic curve cryptography, the foundations of secure web browsing, digital signatures they're potentially vulnerable to future quantum computers. So the keys HSMs are protecting today might be breakable by quantum computers down the line. That's the concern, yes. Current web applications and encryption standards are, generally speaking, vulnerable to these quantum techniques. But quantum also presents a huge opportunity. It opens the door to new forms of cryptography, often called post-quantum cryptography or quantum-resistant algorithms, and potentially even things like quantum key distribution, QKD, which uses quantum mechanics itself to securely share keys in a way that's theoretically impossible to eavesdrop on without detection. So it could lead to much stronger algorithms and potentially truly unbreakable keys. Wow. So a technology that could shatter current security, but also holds the key, pardon the pun, to potentially unbreakable security in the future. That's yeah. quite the paradox. It sounds like a race is definitely on. A very important race, yes. Developing and deploying quantum-resistant cryptography is a major focus in the security world right now. Now, we should also be realistic about HSMs. While they offer incredible security benefits, there are downsides or maybe uh, practical considerations. 
Our sources definitely point out that HSMs aren't cheap. They can be quite expensive to buy, to maintain, and to operate. Often the pricing depends on how many transactions per second they can handle. And there's a learning curve. Companies investing in them need to spend significant time figuring out how to use them effectively, how to manage keys properly within their systems, and how to integrate them smoothly. It's not just plug and play. Right. It's a serious investment in terms of money and expertise. It is. However, the consistent conclusion from the research is pretty stark. Protecting the cryptographic key is ultimately more important than just protecting the encrypted data flying around. Because if the key is safe, the data is safe. HSMs ensure that fundamental protection. So for organizations dealing with really critical information, financial data, personal secrets, intellectual property, the upfront investment in HSMs is often seen as absolutely necessary when weighed against the potentially catastrophic cost of a breach if those keys were exposed. So looking at the big picture and thinking about you, the listener, interacting with all these online services, it really boils down to a calculation, doesn't it? Risk versus the cost of this essential, often invisible security. And these HSMs are right there in the middle, the unseen guardians playing this absolute vital role in trying to keep your digital life, your data secure. So wrapping up our deep dive today, we've explored hardware security modules, HSMs. We've seen they're these crucial physical devices often working behind the scenes, protecting the single most critical element of digital security the cryptographic keys. They do this by creating that isolated, tamper-resistant environment, even using physics itself to generate true randomness or key creation. They really are the bedrock of digital trust today, making everything from secure online payments to cloud computing possible and reliable. Absolutely. We've seen how critical they are now across so many sectors, relying on physical laws for that randomness. But it leaves us with a fascinating thought, especially considering quantum computing. Imagine that future where quantum computers are powerful and widespread. Will today's physical tamper-proof fortresses, these HSMs, be able to evolve fast enough? Can they incorporate quantum-resistant algorithms effectively? Or will the very nature of quantum threats require entirely new ways, maybe even quantum-based ways, to protect that foundational randomness, that noise they currently harvest from the universe? It's a future that demands constant, deep innovation to stay ahead. What does unbreakable even mean in a quantum world?